Pointing to the half Torah. You can see the uh, Isaiah chapter 40 is what we're going to concentrate on today. So the Torah portion is called Ba'ev Kanan, which means I pleaded, and uh, but we're going to focus primarily on Isaiah 40. So let's get started in prayer together. Father in heaven, we pray that we have ears to hear and eyes to see, that your scripture opens up and we can see it clearly, Father, that you remove the scales from our eyes, the veils from our eyes, and that we can see things. And, and that we become boldly in, in your kingdom, we come before you. We thank you in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's start off with Isaiah 40, verse 12. Uh, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the Holy Spirit, the Ruach? Who has, who has been able to measure the Ruach? No one. Who is the, uh, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who has made him understand? So we're going to build on that today. Do you know that there is a council of Yehovah? There's a council of How many people knew that? Okay. Do you know that he has multiple councils? Do you know that he does councils? Throughout time, he's always doing councils. Okay? And do you know what those councils are for? These councils are to make decisions on important things that are going to happen in the kingdom. Before the death and resurrection of Yeshua, there was a council. Before creation, there was a council. Right? Before the ten tribes were exiled, there was a council. Before King Ahab died, there was a council. There's councils that are set up all through scripture, and we're going to look at these councils and ask some fundamental questions. You know, Can we be part of those councils? Will he draw us near to be involved in these councils? We're going to look at some of that today. But in this case, it says, what man shows him his counsel? This is important because I think it's a testimony for our times when we look at this. All right, Job chapter 15, we see a similar uh, conversation going on in verse 7. It says, are you the first man to be born? Job. Obviously, Job was not the first man to be born, right? So it's kind of rhetorical. So he's, are you the first man to be born? Where are you brought forth before the hills, before creation? Do you listen in on God's counsel? There's a question there. Could Job be brought in on God's counsel? And not only his counsel, could he be brought in? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we don't know? What do you understand that we do not understand? So you see two scripture verses here is talking specifically about a council that's being formed for specific reasons. And, and God is asking the question, are you, are you, were you there in those councils? So is there, there's an idea of, can we be involved in this? So if we read both these passages, we can understand, I mean, we can put together, before creation, there was a, there was a major council that was established. Let's take a look at that real quick. In Genesis 1, verse 26, it says, Then our Elohim said, Let us make man in our image. Now, we've taken this to believe what? Trinity, some people talk about in the church, other people says, I know in Judaism they refer to it, there, there are angels involved in the air, but there was a council set up before creation. Okay? Uh, now, what, what is important about here is before man of breath was, was breathed into Adam, there was a council that decided how this was going to go about. A blueprint was put together, and from that blueprint, there was an execution of that. And he's asking the question, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the flying creatures of the sky, over the livestock, over the whole earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the land. God created humankind in his image. In his image, God created him. Male and female, he created them. In Genesis chapter 3, we see another, it doesn't explicitly state that there's a council here. But it says, then Adonai Elohim said, Behold, the man has become like us. There's another council having to deal with him being ejected from the garden. Okay? Uh, like the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So now in case he stretches out his hand and takes also from the tree of life, and he eats of this forever, Adonai Elohim sent him away from the garden to Eden to work the ground form which, the form which he has been taken. All right, so two things. I want you to answer these questions. Are you a friend? I want you to listen to this because this is important. Do you consider yourself a friend of our Elohim? Okay? Is the relationship you have with him as a friend? No, I want you to think about that for a minute. Are you and I, as individuals, the people that walk in the kingdom, allowed to become part of these councils that he's been referring to in all these scripture verses? Okay? And what is the purpose of being 
any one of these bounces. I'm going to ask you to add a fourth question. Do you feel bold enough in your prayer life and in your walk in the Lord that you can come before him in his presence boldly? Okay? It's really important. If, if God gives you a divine appointment, like he, well, we talked about, like he's got a divine appointment for Leslie and Paul, if a divine appointment is placed before you, are you bold enough to begin to respond to that? Can you speak boldly with clarity? Can you give your testimony without, with no hesitation? Because these appointed times we're doing for prayer are about that. They're not just so we can bring petitions, and that's part of it. It's so we can be doing the will of the Father. Okay? And the will of the Father is what? To bring, to love your neighbor. And what, what loving your neighbor means a lot of things. From simply helping somebody else to encouraging, to actually sometimes putting them on your back and carrying them. Loving your neighbor means a lot. So when these divine appointments come, are you bold enough to speak for them or cringe and say, well, maybe somebody else will be there for me. Somebody else is better at them. I don't have the personality. I'm a shy person. I'm kind of timid. He's important because if we go through these things, this is the expectation of the kingdom, and we're going to talk about specifically how this works out. Right? Let's look at what is, what is a council. Anybody, anybody been a part of a council? All right. All right. We're, Johnny, you and I, Monday, we're going to have a council, right? We're going to deal with a specific topic that we, we're, you know, we're, we have been sharing back and forth. So we're going to come into a council, and we're going to make some decisions. Is a council a dictatorship where one person speaks and everybody listens? Or is a council to bring ideas and share and make something happen that's based on a common goal or purpose? Okay? That's what a council is. Okay? These councils are called in specific periods. I'll, I'll tell you that every council that we read in Scripture, every single one of them takes place during the millennium, during the point times. Every single one of them. From Passover, there's councils taking place. During uh, Shavuot, at Pentecost, there's, there's, there's councils being... God makes big things happen in these appointed times. Okay? That's why Shabbat is so important. That's why the church not understanding about Shabbat is a loss to them. Because this is an appointed time. You know, we can say, well, there's every day in the heavens. Yes, every day is. But this is specifically set apart to be an appointed time for a council to be established. So don't ever forget how important this is. They appear to always take place in these appointed times. During these times, there's argument. There's no arguments. This is important. During these councils, there's no arguments. There's no accusations. And the deceiver, a satan, cannot be present in these councils. Okay? In these councils, you are led through the Holy Spirit to speak when you're allowed to. Sometimes you're silent. Sometimes you speak. Sometimes you speak boldly. Sometimes you speak softly. But in these councils... All through the times, they're done in the Spirit, but they're, they're counseled all throughout Scripture. We're going to look at each individual. Okay. Next. In the kingdom, there's different levels. Anybody heard there's those who are greater in the kingdom and those who are lesser in the kingdom, right? What, what would be somebody who's greater in the kingdom? What would be somebody who's considered great in the kingdom? 24 hours. Very good. That's a good example. How about the, our 12 apostles? Okay. We would consider them. How about somebody who's meek and humble, who keeps the commandments of Yehovah every day of his life. That's someone who's great. He cares, he cares for the widows and orphans. That person's great in the kingdom. You know who's lesser in the kingdom? A one who teaches the chores that you've away with. That's the person. Matthew 5 tells us that somebody who teaches other people that, that scripture's been done away with is lesser in the kingdom. Now, I don't know what all that implies in, the, in, in our in our. In, I don't know what all that means, but I don't want to be labeled as lesser in the kingdom when I have a choice to do to help the widow, the orphan, and the poor. When I have the opportunity to do his will, and I had a whole lifetime to accomplish that. I don't want to be labeled. I don't want that to be put on me. I don't want that to be around my neck, to be lesser in the kingdom. Because if I'm allowed into this kingdom, I want to give it all I got. Amen? Yeah. So here we see all, all this is based on a relationship with your king and your obedience in the king. We're looking at Luke. The first level, uh, when you first accept Yeshua and you accept him and you do a confession of the faith, what's the first thing that you're called when you enter the kingdom? Servants. Okay? So what does a servant do? What's a, what's a servant do? Anything the same as that? Whatever he's doing. Whatever he's doing. 
whatever he's doing. A servant is someone who does things when nobody knows about it. They get no credit for it. They do it day in and day out, and they do it because their heart is into it. And that's, that's a servant. If somebody comes to know Yeshua and never serves, how can they be called part of the kingdom? It's a key, right? So, that, you know you know how you define somebody? You don't judge another person's soul. You never do that, right? But you know what you can judge? The fruits of their life. You can judge whether they're serving or they're shrinking back. You can see that. It's out there for sure. The second thing is, the second position is called friend. So we got, we got a servant and you got a friend. Can a, can a friend be a servant? Yes, they have to be. You always have to be a, a, a servant. But not all servants are considered friends in the kingdom. Okay, we're going to some scripture here. All right, so look, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now Yeshua was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Master. Now the word master is what a servant would say to someone. Okay? Today we would say, Sir. And that's how we would refer to somebody, sir, uh, Mr. So-and-so, sir. These are terms, master is the same term, okay? Master teaches to pray just as John taught his disciples, okay? Now, this is the first level. When you first come to the kingdom, this is the way you should learn how to pray. It's very important. He says, then Yeshua said to them, when you pray, say, Father, sanctify your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, and we forgive everyone, and debt it to us, and lead us not into temptation. So the three aspects of being a servant are this. One, a servant becomes, he always comes and is asking for his daily needs. That's what a servant does. In other words, when he shows up to work, do you leave a servant without food all day, or do you give him water and food? Okay? So the servant, the person who works for you, you have to take care of the basic needs. He's always there. There's nothing. Second thing, the servant is always, because they're still struggling with generational curses, still struggling with the sins of their families, their own lives, a servant is constantly dealing in forgiveness, forgiving others, for asking forgiveness for their actions. A servant is a constant struggle. It's a constant struggle in their personal life. Third, a servant is always praying for protection. I believe you should always pray for these things, but it's a place where you're, you're I'm going to say stuck at, but it's a place where you're never going to really see the full picture of what our king wants for you. Okay? It's important. You're not going to see the whole thing. So let's look at the next slide. It says in Luke chapter 11, verse 5, that Yeshua said to him, Which of you has a friend and will go to him in the middle of the night and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing set before him. Okay, so let me give you a picture. Has anybody been there? Somebody says, Man, I don't have the I don't have the knees to set up to do this this meal. So you turn to a friend and say, Hey, can you help me out here? Okay? So friend is between two situations. You've got this person on this end who's coming to them, and another person who's a relationship, okay, that they're asking for help. So what is that called when you have somebody in the intermediate, in the middle? What is that person? Mediator, a broker, okay? Was Yeshua in the middle for that? Right? That's how you show a place. So we would come to him for our needs. Can I have some bread? And then he would turn to the Father and pray for this. And that would be carried to him. So there's an in, there's intermediate relationship. Okay? So as he's speaking about a friend, it says, Then from within he may answer. So the guy is being knocked on the door. He's not going to say it out loud. Well, hopefully he doesn't. In his mind, he says the following. Don't bother me. That door is already locked. My children are in bed. In other words, just go away. Please go away. You know, Carl, we're talking about that. It's kind of like you get in that phone call, and you see the cell phone, and the name comes across, and you go, should I answer, 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 should I answer? Okay, I'll answer it. You hit the button, right? That's the same thing. At the door, somebody's knocking. Should I answer? I'll just pretend I'm on vacation. I'll never know. Oh, my car's out in front. Forget it. All right, what can I do for you? You see, this is the situation you see, Sam. Then I can't get up to you. I can get up to you and do not give you anything. I'll tell you, even if the friend will not get up, give him anything out of friendship, yet because of the man's persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And as he needs important. So this relationship in prayer, right? so he's taking two contracts. we got this relationship of a servant and this relationship of a friend. Okay? There are two parts of the kingdom, and we're going to see how one is impact, one, how one plays together. Now, Luke chapter 11 goes on, verse 9, it says, So I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you, seek and you shall find Knock and it shall be opened to you, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks will be opened. And I will say this. How many people have knocked their whole lives and had a 
prayers and never hear the answers. Okay? How many people have had petitions and never heard something coming back? This is very important. So, I was listening to something uh, on the news the other day, and the person says, well, you know, why don't you just, they, they were not a believer, so why don't you just pray for me? Okay? Well, what does a non-believer need to do? When a non-believer is asking for prayer, okay, but you're leading the, what's the main important thing to bring a non-believer into? It's very important. What's what do you bring a non-believer into? Into covenant. In covenant, into relationship. You teach them who Yeshua is, the works of the Messiah. That's what you bring a non-believer. But if you have somebody who's been in the faith their whole life, what do you do with the person who's struggling and never getting answers to their prayers or their petitions? Gotta find out why. Well, what's what are most people who are struggling in their faith dealing with? Sin and lack of obedience. Number one. All right. So when you got somebody who's a servant and having difficulty with obedience and issues, they're, that's their blocking. That's why they're having issues in their prayer life. And this is very, very important to understand why somebody always stays a servant in the kingdom and never becomes and gets into a relationship with their friend. Okay. Let's look at this here. It says in verse 12, sorry, what father, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? And if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the ruach of the best to those who ask him? That's the key, right there. How many people have asked for the Holy Spirit to come upon them and change their life? This is really important. If you do not ask for the Holy Spirit to dwell and come and guide you in your life, you will always struggle as servants, one foot in, one foot out of the kingdom. Okay? Without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, this will always be a struggle for you for the rest of your life. Now, I know a lot of, a lot of denominations and a lot of places out there have paint a picture of this, and I want you to understand what really, because we're going to use scripture to define the relationship and how the Holy Spirit works and stuff. Okay? Uh, it's not just someone who speaks in tongues or interprets tongues. It's much more than that. It's hearing his voice. It's a prompting. When there's a divine appointment, you act upon those divine appointments. It's not stuck in this place where I'm not sure if I'm going to go forward. I mean, I, I have been there. I have sat in a balcony of a church, listened, and I just sit there looking at my watch and waited to get out of there. Anybody, has anybody else ever been in that place? 30, 45 minutes, you wait. Well, this pastor's going over way too long. I wish he'd hurry up and quit what he's got to say so I can get back to my life. Well, that's a person who's not guided by the Holy Spirit. It's not. You go back to your life, and you go back to that place, and you go back to your struggles, the Holy Spirit is not working in your life. Okay, this is key. All right. So in a position of friend, you are in a position where you're interceding for somebody else. All right? That means we have petitions today. You spend less time worrying about your personal needs, and you turn all your focus in praying for somebody else's needs. Is anybody there? You guys there? Where you spend 90% of your prayers is praying for somebody else? Because he said he's going to take care of our needs. If we're keeping kingdom business, seek first the kingdom of God, and all things will give you. know, that seek first. So if you're seeking first, you don't have to worry about your basic needs. So you need to spend in your relationship with the Father, needs to be interceding and praying for other people. That's a friend. Because you're caring more for other needs than your own needs. Second thing, you're boldly able to come and ask for wisdom, knowledge, and gifts of the Ruach. I think this is a struggle that most of us have. I, I honestly believe the boldness, because when we start showing you the scriptures, I know the first thing that pops into my mind, well, that's just Abraham, right? Or that's just Jeremiah, okay? Well, that's just King David. He's special. He's different. And you don't realize that there were things that Yeshua said that in this generation, there'll be things done that weren't done in the first century. And there was unbelievable things done in the first century. So something says that there's another level into the relationship with the Father that we haven't even tasted. And okay? there's so much more to this. And the last, are you walking in the real life? Are you walking in this Holy Spirit? Is he guiding you? Is he the center of your life? And can you say, Bo Ruach Elohim, and hear the voice of the Lord. Why am I showing you this? Because I think this is important. Because when you see this part of Scripture read, we think it's always somebody else. This is why when I began to study this, I always thought, well, this was something, you know? I didn't know. I don't have that talent. 
I'll, I'll tell you a story, and this is important because it affected me as a kid. Um, I struggled with my family, with my parents were missionaries, right? And that was their thing. My dad played golf, so I made sure I didn't play the sport that my dad played, right? I, I struggled with that because I was in rebellion as a kid, right? And I remember my parents came back from Peru. We were in, we were in, I was in a high school, junior high, it's actually eighth grade. I was in a junior high out in California, and a kid goes, what does your dad do? And I took, I don't know what, you know, you think about Google Chat and these things, I've had a repent so many times. And I told him, you know, it's it just it, I cringe when I think about it, but I said, well, my dad's in the oil industry. I was not, I'm serious, I told him that. And I think back, I said, why was I, why was I shrinking from somebody who was doing the work of the Lord? You know how many times I think that's bothered me, and I've had to say, if I ever find that kid, I'll tell him the truth. And then years later, in my 40s, and God is having the same place as my, my dad. I think that's funny, I'm telling you, because I never saw myself as him. That was him. That was what he was called to do. That's his plan for the God. I'm going to do something else. And so I spent years doing other things. I guess I showed up to church. Because you know what? A lot of, there was a time when I first got the I'm going to just show you something. There's times when I would go to church because I knew my dad would ask me what the sermon was. Uh -huh. And I would go and I'd make sure I'd take the bulletin with me because if most of the bulletin would tell me what it was about so I could share it with them. I wasn't going to lie to him, but I had to go. That's the wrong reasons. Right? That is not a relationship. That's not even a servant. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. When we look at these things, we got to look at it. You know, God is what, he's looking for people to get in his counsel. And I'm going to share this with you. It's just a different level. Let's take a look at this. From the position of a friend, you're able to go into these councils. You can come into the courts of heaven and draw near to him. You can intercede for others and have effectiveness in your prayers, and you'll see prayers being answered when you're interceding for others, immediately. You'll hear his voice, and he'll prompt you and tell you how to pray for somebody. Because when the Holy Spirit tells you how to pray, you'll be saying the right things. Okay, this is key. You'll receive multiple gifts of the Holy Spirit. It won't just be one, you'll have multiple gifts. I mean, look at Apostle Paul. He had them all, right? That's, I mean, again, we don't see this ourselves in Apostle Paul. That's, that's a special God, and he was. You receive physical and spiritual blessings, and this is the most important about being a friend of Yahweh, more than anything else. <clears throat> that not only are you blessed, but generations are blessed for your commitment and obedience to the Father. Generations. 34, 5, 10 generations are affected because one person is walking there. Okay, this is very, very important. Alright, so let's look at the first time we encounter a council. It's in Genesis 18, verse 16. It says, Then a man got up from there and looked down over Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. And when Adonai says, and he turns, to, uh, so we know, we know this, we believe this, the, uh, the member, the free part of Yeshua. He turns to the two angels and he says this, Should I keep secret from Abraham what I'm about to do? Now, why would he ask that question? Don't read the rest of these questions. Don't read the rest of these Why would he ask that question? I don't know, what do you think? What do you think he's going to, why is he going to ask, why should we bring him to this council? Because it is a council, by the way. He's asking a specific question. Why is he going to, why should we keep a secret? Well, let's just answer with scripture. Seeing that Abraham will certainly become great in a mighty nation, and in him all nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have made myself known to him, so that he will command his sons and his household after him to keep the way of other nine. By doing that, he underlined it. By doing righteousness and justice. What is that? Does anybody know what justice and righteousness is? That's part of it. That's right. He's saying that every humble and integrity, the humble and integrity. It is the mandate of the kingdom of Israel. It is our mandate. It's our mission. It's our purpose. It's our vision. It's everything wrapped into one. If the kingdom, the body, these body of believers all over the world, if they are not doing this one thing, they're not in him. They're just, they, they, he doesn't know, he doesn't, because they're completely separate. If a body of believers is not doing justice and righteousness, they're not in him. Okay. He says, him to keep the way of Adonai by doing justice and righteousness, so that Adonai may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. All right? So what he's getting ready to do, he's going to take Abraham, he's going to bring him into council, because they've got to make a decision about Sodom. 
Now, judgment has been already decided. So in the court of heaven, there's been a judgment, and the judge has said, we're going to bring justice right now. Enough. This is over. Right? But he decides to set up a council because he's going to test Abraham. And part of it, but this is important because he's going to test us in the same way. Okay? But in this council, we're going to decide whether we're going to be full judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah or if there's going to be any leniency. When Moses intercedes for Israel, what happens? He brought leniency. There was still punishment, but he interceded in a council and brought leniency on the kingdom. So what he's about ready to do here is seek mercy for Sodom and Gomorrah. See, this, this is the heart of our, our king. Do you understand that? This is his heart. He has, to, he has to follow through with justice. But whether the justice is harsh and final or whether it's lenient, depends on who's interceding. You know, we've got family members that have been rebelling a long time. And a decision at some point is going to be made about them. This is, it may be a city, it's an individual, it could be a community, but decisions are made about everybody at some point. Right? And when that happens, is there somebody who's going to step in like Abraham to be interceding for leniency for them? Right? This is why the council are important. Abraham is brought into the council again for a couple of reasons. His obedience, and this is key, his obedience time after time, day after day, year after year, hour after hour, you know, whether it's raining or whether it's sunshine, he's there, he's obedient, he strives through. Yes, he struggles like you and I, but he was always consistent with one thing. He was going to be obedient, and he kept his eyes focused on the Father. That's what he always did. And his funny thing is he only knew our king is El Shaddai. That's the only name he knew. He doesn't have, he didn't have a tenth of the revelation that you and I have to the entire scriptures. But yet he was considered a friend of God. He knew him as just a provider. All right, second. He was going to execute his purpose on the earth through Abraham and that's through us. And so through Abraham, that purpose is being done through who? Israel and by everybody who's grafted in to him. So that purpose. So this is a big picture. This is why we have to be in, we have to be aligned with this. The reading Second Chronicles twenty verse seven says, "Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of listen that your friend Abraham forever?" I don't. I've read that many times. I always saw your friend Abraham. I never saw forever. I never saw that. And why is that important? Because we look at this world in the 50, 60, 70, 90, 100 years that I've had, and that's how we see a lot of things. He's talking about an eternal thing. James 2, 23 also says that Abraham was a friend of the Father. Now look at this. I want you to read Luke 16. It's very important. This is what forever means. It happened that a poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Then the rich man also died and was buried. So at the same time, at a specific time, there was going to be the death in the community. The rich man who was following his own ways, and this other man who was following in the ways of the Bible. And it says here, Then the rich man also died and was buried. And from Sheol, as he was in torment, he raised his eyes, and he sees Abraham far off. So this place must be very close, okay? For him to see with his own eyes, uh, he's able to see that from Sheol, where he's being tormented, there's paradise very close to him, and he's seeing this. And uh, he says, he raises his eyes and he sees Abraham far off, and Lazarus is at his side. Some of your translation says, what do they call it? Does anybody know what it says, the translation there? Abraham, it was Abraham's bosom. Yeah, yeah. How many people know what that means? That's a Hebrew idiom, by the way. How many people know what that means? Okay. When you're the, at the bosom of something, what are you doing? You're getting nourishment. What is, what is our nourishment? Torah. In the in after he's passed away, he's bringing nourishment to everybody who's in paradise. That's a big deal. I think sometimes we let that run. We think we're just sleeping in the earth. But he's this is at his side, Abraham's bosom, and he's continued to give nourishment. Continue to give. Remember, he's a friend forever. This is not just a friend for the, how many years was he on? 475 years he was on the earth? This is forever. He has a purpose forever. And he says, uh, so he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so he may dip the, 
the tip of the finger in water and cool off my tongue because I am suffering torment in the flame. Right? This is forever, guys. Right? This is forever. But yet, the ones that decide what we're doing continue to nourish. This is why it's so important for people to say that something's been done away with. When we have, after somebody's passed away, they continue to nourish and teach and the foundations of our community. Right? Isn't that a big deal? How many other people are in that position who are friends of the Father who are still involved? I'll give you another example of this. Um, in the book of Revelation, uh, the Apostle John has brought Revelation to him. And he falls down on his knees, and what does the guy, the guy for the messenger say to him? Get up. I'm just like you. I'm one of your brothers. Okay? There's a friend who's got a purpose after he's passed away. It's continuing on. It's not just. We think, again, we think 70, 80, 90 years, and this is much more, because what you do here on earth has an impact forever, everlasting impact on your life. So in Acts 13, it says that David was a man after his own heart who will do his will. He wrote the entire Psalms 119. The entire, that entire psalm is based on what? Does anybody know what's the entire Psalm 119? The longest chapter in the entire Bible. The commandments of Torah and obedience to the Torah. That's what it is. So the longest thing, the one who has a heart of the Lord, as a friend, is saying that this is more important than anything else. You've got to know his heart. You know the heart of the Father. I'm going to teach you this. I'm going to put it just song. And we're going to sing about the importance of the heart of the Father. When we study those in Scripture, we have, we have, who have an intimate relationship with their Heavenly Father, this is what they have. They were fulfilling the will all the time. God has, we've spoken about this many times, but there's a book that's written on it. There's a scroll with your name on it. We've spoken about this for several weeks and months now. There's a, something that's been written about you before you were even born. We get a witness of this when Rebecca prays, and she asks about the two, the two twins that are inside of her, right? They're about ready to give birth, and they're struggling. And she asks what's going on, and he tells her the fate of world, what's going to happen in their life, their destiny, right? Well, that applies to every single one of us. Some people have gone off track, right? We've gotten way off track. And so whatever's been written about you, specifically for you to do in the kingdom, the will of the Father, you're either on it and on that track and developing the relationship with the Father, or you're running like I was doing. <laughs> trying to find another excuse, another day to do something else. And this is key because we want to we want to move from that place to being a, being a friend. All right, so let's look here. John 15, 12. This is very, very important. The scripture to tie this together. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I've loved you. No one has greater love than, than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Right? For a soldier, this makes sense, right? Because you're out of combat, you're on war, you understand this. But I don't how do we see this applying to us on a daily basis? Sometimes we have to sacrifice. Yes. Sometimes we have to sacrifice our Right? How many times have we actually had to set our side, a life aside so we can focus on that family member? Hours and days and months and weeks and years for that. That's giving your life for a friend. That's what that means. You're doing it. You're taking your life that's been going in this direction and you're saying, I've got to set it aside because I have a family member I've got to give everything to. Because for whatever reason in life, this happened and I've got to set my life. That's, that's giving your life for somebody. Now here's what he says to his apostles. Verse 14, John chapter 15. You are my friends. Okay, what did he call them before? Servants. What's he calling them now? Friends. You are my friends. Is, is a friendship, can a friendship go away? Who's had friends from high school you don't even talk to? Right? So, do friends disappear, right? There's condition here in this friendship. You are my friends if, I put that in red so you guys can see the if. If you do not, if you do what I command you to do, that's a question that we all have to ask. What do you command me to do? What's my purpose? What's your will? What was I what was I born to do in this kingdom? What's my position? And let me just spend all my time doing that. Yes, I got a job. Yes, I have other other, other things that are part of my life. But this one thing will be my priority. Period. This is a good priority. And if you do that, then you become God. This is key as you go into these relationships. You see this relationship grow. This part here says, I am no longer calling you servants, 
For the servant does not know what his master is doing. Now I have called you friends because everything I've heard from my father I have made known to you. So you've got it all. Your eyes, you know, the scales are off. You know, you no longer have that veil that's covering your eye. You can now see clearly. We've been here, we've been doing this for several years. You should now be able to see this clearly. All right. How long before when Abraham left Ur to the time that that was pronounced over him? How many years do you think took place before he was following him? Years. Okay. <laughs> How long for the apostles to go from becoming servants to becoming called friends? Three years. What do both of those things have in common besides the number three? <laughs> time. It takes time to develop this relationship. A relationship doesn't happen overnight. One of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing, we're taking those appointed times and you're going to get that song, show up at your, it's going to force you into habits. And in the beginning, it's awkward, but little by little, you'll begin to be able to expand your prayer life and it becomes stronger. I will tell you, I met somebody that used to tell me that he averaged prayer every day was over an hour, an hour or two hours a day. That's strong. And I asked him, how did you do that? Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking my one to two minutes, right? And he's talking 60 to 90 minutes, right? And he says, I started with one minute, and then five, and then 10. And year by year, I began to find time in my day where it would wake me up, and I'd be able to spend time, and it grew. And that's what, that's what he said, it's, it's, a, it's a process. And that's where you, you have to have a goal, something you're shooting for. And if you're in the will of Father, it becomes a lot easier. Relationships take time, as we spoke of before. Being a friend of your king has a lot of benefits. I'll say that again. Being a friend of Yehovah has a tremendous amount of benefits. Okay? Benefits you don't even see. Let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah has an interest. This is kind of where this is in true. He says, Jeremiah 23, uh, 18 says, For who has stood in the council of Abinah? Who has stood in the council of Yehovah? That he should see and hear his word. Who has heard to his word, who has heard to his word and obeyed it? Look, a storm of other is going out in fury. Yes, a whirling tempest will swirl down on the head of the wicked. The anger of other will not turn until he is executed and fulfilled. Look at that. The purposes of his heart. If you're a friend, okay, and you're in his will, he's going to let you know his purpose, and he's going to let you know it pretty quickly. Like Abraham. Abraham. We went to, we're, going to, we're going to bring you in about Sodom and Gomorrah. This is what's happened over Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is what I want you to think about. All right? And the last, now this is what I want you to focus on. I'm going to read verse 20 again. The anger of Father and I will not turn until he is executed and fulfilled the purpose of his heart. In the last days, you will discern it clearly. So let me say it. We are in the last days. Whenever you have your eyes pop open, I want you to be focused here. We are in the last days. For any reason you don't think we are, Israel's back. Okay? Jerusalem's back in the hands of Israel. I'll show you an example. See this? It's called the head. Does anybody know where that comes from, that color? It's from a snail. All right? But why is that important? Because they had a council in Jerusalem. Several members of rabbis came together and said, you know, should we continue keeping our seat seats the color white? Or should we make it a dye and find a blue color? And they argued in the council. Some put their opinions here and some said another opinions. Within the week, this back, in, this back in the 90s, within a few weeks on the coast of the Mediterranean, <coughs> Israel, thousands and thousands of things were washing up on the shore. We are in the end times. That doesn't happen unless we're coming upon the end times. Right? That's really, really important that we know that it has to be sobering, but here's what it says. In the last days, you guys are going to understand this very clearly. All the scales that are on our eyes, they're going to fall off. They're going to come off. We're going to be able to see clearly. All right. I believe that Jeremiah is telling us that today, in our days, we will be given understanding and wisdom and be able to stand in the council of the upper bottom. I'm going to give you, another, I'm going to give you several examples about these councils. So this should be something in your life. You get invited into something because you're a friend and you're somebody's loyal, right? You become a part of something because you've been serving and you have not been every day of your life being relentless to this. 
All right, let's look at give you a couple of examples. So this will kind of open this picture. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says, But you, Daniel, close up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run back and forth and knowledge will increase. So let's go back to Jeremiah's words. In the last days, you'll discern it clearly. Daniel said, you're going to see the book clearly. It's going to be opened up at that time. Apostle John says the same exact words. In another Revelation 10, 4, it says, and when the seven thunders had spoken, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven that says, Seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. So things are going to be revealed in this generation to people in this room. They're going to be brought into these councils and given this understanding that for 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years, they haven't had any idea about it. And it's going to be a revelation. There's going to be, Paul taught on something where, he, uh, where Yeshua healed a man, and he told him, Be quiet, go home, and don't go through the town. Be, be a silent. There's going to be things that are going to be shared with you because you're in the council of the Lord. He's going to say something, and you're going to keep it to yourself until the right time, when the right place is there, and then you're going to be able to be able to prophesy and give those teachings to somebody. This is key. This is this generation. When, I, when, I, when I'm telling you this, it's not to shirk from you. You can't be timid here at all. You cannot be timid. 1 Kings 22. So let's look at a council. Now, uh, Richard and I had a big interaction. We had a discussion about this council. And, and I, he, he proposed something. He brought something for me and made me think. Because I couldn't quite understand everything. But a little while, as I began to study this, it began to make sense. But I want you to focus. This is a council going on. So let me give you two points. In 1 Kings 22, there is a council that's going on, and we've spoken about this three weeks ago. There's a council going on in, North, in the northern kingdom, in Samaria. You have King Jehoshaphat, who's the king of Judah, and I have King Ahab, the king of Israel. They've all got their people around them, their advisors. Okay? Just like our president or our prime minister, you'll have your advisors all around you. And they're saying, how should we do this and should we do this? Well, Ahab decided to bring in prophets that weren't of the Lord God. They weren't, they weren't Cohen's. They weren't prophets of the Lord. They weren't Levites. These men were Asherah prophets. They were worshiping false gods, and they had been left in the kingdom. So since the days, since the days of uh, Elijah, the 450 male prophets were killed, these 400 were still alive. So why would you listen to this? So on the earth, there's this council of Micaiah's there. He says, therefore hear the words of the Lord. He's speaking to Ahab. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing by, on his right side hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up and may fall at the Lord? So let me stop right there. A decision had been made. Ahab actually repented of his sins. But he didn't clear the northern kingdom of the Bibles. You still have the two bull calves in, in Tel Dan and in, uh, in the Bell. You still have these Asherah prophets. There are still high places where people were burning incense on these places. There are still people that were worshiping false things. He did not take a stand. He took a stand for his own life, but he didn't take a stand. So the Lord said, I gave you a chance. Why don't you clear this up? You did repent, but you didn't clear the things. So a time has come for when you bring this, this chapter of your kingdom. Your, your dynasty, the Omri dynasty, is going to come to a close now. And so the decision was made by a judge and a court. Okay? And so now we have a council to decide how to execute that judgment. Does that make sense? Do judges not do this? Judges do this all the time. They make a decision, you say it's guilty, then they deliberate on the term of the sentence, maybe a week later or a few days later. It happens all the time in the United States. A council, usually he takes his own counsel. Sometimes he may call somebody else and say, how did you act in this thing? He may seek out, but we never see judges do. Okay. So then he says, then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord. So what happened? We can go back to verse, uh, verse 20. It says, and the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may, he may fall at Rumble Gilead? And so, this, so one individual spoke up in the council and said, this thing. And then somebody else said, well, why don't we do this? And another person says, why don't we do this? So there's, in these councils, he's letting his people, his creation, he's letting them give advice. He's bringing them in. And finally it says, that one individual, one of, the, one of the created beings, the spirit, says, came forward and stood before the Lord and says, I will persuade him, my king. I will persuade him. And the Lord said to him, in what way? What's your plan? You ever been, you ever been in a meeting? You voice something, and then the boss turns and he says, well, what's your plan? I, I've been there. 
And then, okay, now I've got, I've got to come up with something, right? Well, he's got to come up with a plan. He's thought it through. And so he says, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets. Now, these weren't, these weren't Levites, these weren't Cohen's, these were false prophets in the nation of the Northern Kingdom. Let me tell you about these false prophets. These false prophets taught the nation of Israel, they taught the Israelites that there was such thing as fertility worship. And it was okay to do that. And to not to seek him a while for to not be your Shaddai, to seek this out because somebody could become pregnant if they sought this guy out. That's what they were teaching. So in other words, what were these prophets teaching? Lies. Lies. What were they doing? Every day they woke up, what were they teaching? Lies. And the next day, what were they teaching? Lies. That was their lot, to teach lie after lie after lie, and deceive and deceive and deceive. That's who these 400 were. That was their character. That was their nature. That was who they were. That's who they sold themselves to, because they were not worshiping the one true king. So let's keep killing When a deceiving spirit is placed into these men, it was what they already were. You're not changing their nature. You're just bringing their nature out. You're allowing them to be who they always have been. Does that make sense? So then he says, so he I'll go up and put a lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. So therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. And the Lord has declared a disaster against you. Do you know that King Jehoshaphat would refuse to take any advice from those four hundred prophets? Those, they were in the council, and he said, I don't care about what they have to say. We're not listening to that voice. And this council, we're going to take people who are the ones you got. That's key. Let's get with counsel, right? Does everybody understand a counsel now? So let's look at Micaiah. Do you understand that Micaiah in the spirit was taking them into this council and able to see all this? Do you see this? This is somebody from the earthly realm that was taken out of the earthly realm in spirit and allowed to see a big picture of the council to heaven. And he was he was given he was given the information. I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen in this generation. There's going to be things happening all over this world people will be brought in place in certain positions in cabinets of prime ministers and kings and all, and God's going to put them there for a time when they're going to be able to be part of that council. And they're going to be given information, because that's what our scriptures tell us, and they're going to be able to speak clearly to these presidents, kings, and prime ministers. Alright. We know in order to come into the council, we must be considered a friend first. You cannot come into that council if you don't have a relationship, you'll never be brought in. Develop that relationship, he becomes known as friend. He, there's going to be times when he says, Come in, I want to give you a little information. The secret things, but they're not secret. It's just so the rest of us don't have their secret things. No arrogant person can ever get in the council of the Lord. Okay? This is the person who comes to the council of the Lord must be very humble, must be meek, must have love for people, must be like Abraham who wants to save lives. Okay? So we're going to look at two more councils. In this. You're going to see how important this is. Genesis 18 30 says, Abraham drew near and said, Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? So let's, let's give you. So Abraham's concerned about what? Just read this again. Abraham drew near and said to his guest, who we believe is Messiah, Will you really sweep away everybody in Sodom and Gomorrah, even those who are righteous or following their ways? Are you going to get rid of them too? What's he concerned about? What's, what, what's he's interceding for? Righteous, Righteous people. If you, I'm going to show you, Carmen and I talked about this earlier about the sign. Is, there was never an intercessory for Lot. I'll say this again. He never brings Lot's name up. He never speaks of him. He never talks about his own nephew. Ever. When he does his intercessory and he tries to save lives, He's focused on righteous people. Is that person merit being the counsel of the Lord? Because it's got to be more than just the person you know that you're interceding for. You've got to have a heart for people that you don't even know and be able to intercede for them. That's how you get brought in these councils. It's way beyond, it's my cousin. It's much more than that. So what Abraham is key for now, how does he want to proceed? Let's look at this. In verse 25, it says, he begins, okay, this, this is interesting. Because I read this and I read through it real quick. But the way he uses this terminology shows something that's really important. First of all, he says, Far be it from you to do such a thing to cause the righteous to die and the wicked. 
so that the righteous and the wicked share the same fate. Far be it from you. Shall the judge of the whole world would whole world not exercise justice? What's, what's Abraham saying? Yes. I know your nature. I spent the last 30 years being obedient. And I know your nature. Every day, in the heat of the day, in the ninth hour, I come before you and I pray. I've been doing this for year upon year, day upon day, month and month out. I've been coming before you and I know the nature because we've developed a relationship. And I know you. So just to completely wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah and kill everybody, righteous and unrighteous, is not your nature. Because I know you. Guess what? God knows Abraham too. It's that, that word, I, the knowing. It's, a, it's an intimate relationship. There's back and forth here. So who is it? Like I said, who is Abraham confirmed? His fellow believers. People he doesn't know. Let's keep going. Now notice how he approaches it. I'm going to use these five verses here. So then Abraham answered and says, Look, I pray, I've decided to speak to you, my Lord. Though I'm dust and ashes. What's he saying? I'm nothing. You, you've, you've allowed me to be your counsel, but I'm still nothing. I have I can come from dust, I'll go back to dust. But you've allowed me in that. So because you've allowed me in this counsel, just let me bear with me for a little bit. Because I want I'm, I'm seeking justice along here. Then in verse 30 it says, then he says, please let my Lord not be angry, so when I speak, perhaps 30 can be found. Please, Lord, please, my other and I, let, let me, just give me another chance, one more time. Don't, don't, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna be badgering you, I don't wanna be argumentative, because what happened when Moses tried to argue his case about going into the land? He was silent, enough, I've had it, okay? He knows better because he has a fear of your mind. And then he says, look, I pray, this is verse 31, look, I pray, I had decided to speak to my Lord. Perhaps 20 will be found. And this is hot, this is humility. Because if you're in the presence of the Lord and in your will, and you're in this if you're in this situation, what you want to do is keep silent and listen, right? And when you're asked to speak, that's when you step forward and you're bold. Okay, this is key. And when you're bold, but you've always got to be careful to remember who you're in the presence of. Then he says, please let my Lord not be angry, is the last thing he says. So I may speak one last time. Just one last time. And I'll stop you. I'll never say another word. Perhaps Tim will be found here. Now what I'm showing you here, what's well, important, is because you've got a very humble man who's brought into a council and is allowed to speak for those who are going to be for justice. It's allowed. So that's you and I. We're going to be brought into these councils as a relationship develops so we can speak for those who may fall and pick them back up. Guess what? It's not, a, it's not somebody who's powerful. It's not somebody who has all the money and all the fame. The person he brings in is the humble person. All right. How many people understand truly the nature of how to fear your love? How do, do, do we really know that? I think this generation, one thing this generation has lost is the fear of you. We have lost reverence. Okay? Paul was reading. It's awesome. Paul, you may not have noticed it. I know it. Because him and I have been talking about this. When you see in the Psalms, and you read a Psalm, and it says, Salah, it means to bow your nails, you prostrate yourself before the Lord. I noticed when he read it, he did that. And I said, Paul, there's a guy who's humble, who, who understands reverence. That was awesome. Paul, nobody knows that. I saw him. I recognized him. I said, there's a guy. We, we, we both learned that. Somebody taught us that. I didn't know. I didn't know Salah means to be reverent. You know, Bow, bend your knees before the king. You're speaking as to him. Be completely humble, purposeful in your questioning. Pray and speak to save lives. Bring mercy always. This is the heart of our king. Final thing is understand that you are before a holy God, a holy other king. Right? You must always know that if you're brought into this council, you're before. And this is the awesome point. I'm going to show you scripture so you can get a relate to it. Let's look at it. Council of Isaiah, this is in chapter 6. Okay, you might want to turn there because we're going to read from it. Uh, a lot of these things take place in critical moments. Now, two things are happening. The kingdom of Israel is 40 years from being destroyed, and the kingdom of Judah is 100 years from being destroyed. And God begins sending some signs, some big signs. 
And the first thing he does is he sends a massive earthquake that I have read, uh, guys like Velikovsky said, that the earthquake was so strong, and I've read from other sources, so strong that it changed the orbit of the earth. And then from that, for a 10 to 15 year period of time, they were both building stone monuments to figure out the change in the seasons. Okay? We, we, we have a calendar, okay? We have mathematical equations and algorithms that are figured out today. But back then, they built stone monuments to understand the times and the seasons. That's how they figured it out. There's people who were good at it. And for 10 years, they kept building it because it was changing as the earth was wobbling. There was an earthquake so strong that it shaped the foundations of the earth, and every culture writes about the earthquake. Do you know that? So when scripture brings it up and talks about it, it's not an isolated thing. Because how many earthquakes happen in the, in the 4,000, 5,000, 4,000 years of scripture being written, how many earthquakes are mentioned? Two in the present that happen in those 4,000 and one in the future. Okay? So this is one of those earthquakes that's mentioned. The other one's going to be in our time. There's an earthquake in Ezekiel 38 that says that the whole earth fell and everybody on the earth fell to the ground and began to plead to God. And recognize one time an earthquake caused the entire planet. That means everybody. So this is a big deal. Alright, so let's read about the King Zion. King Uzziah, as we find in 2 Chronicles 26, we read about him. The Assyrian, the Assyrian records indicate that Uzziah reigned for 42 years. They say he reigned from, uh, he reigned from 783 to 742. His reign marked the height of Judah's power. Judah got the greatest extent of their kingdom under King uh, Uzziah. Okay? Other nations exacted tribute from the Ammonites. Judah expanded westward and conquered everything around them. Okay? During this period, Uzziah was reigned. The nation prospered, and desert areas were reclaimed by water, conservation. Jerusalem's walls were reconstructed. Towers were added. Engines of war were mounted. And strategic points, a large army was also maintained. The nation's prosperity under the southern kingdom, under Uzziah, was considered to have been a result of King's fidelity, fidelity to what? Fidelity to our king. So he was blessed because of that. So there's two things that happens here. We have a king that was constantly focused on blessing your body. And he reigned for 52 years. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, for 52 years. Now scripture tells us that Uzziah's strength caused him to become proud, and which led to his destruction. Does anybody know what he did? Now here's a guy who for 40 plus years, he was faithful. Okay? And then one day something got into him. He says, you know what? I'm stronger than God's ways. I can do this. I want, I want their job. He, he did what's called Baal, he croached, he croached on somebody else. And they said that he tried to go take his own incense and light it in the temple in the holy place. On the altar of incense, he tried to light his own incense. And the scripture tells us it took 80 Levites to restrain him. That's how strong he was. 80 Levites to carry him out. And when he gets in there, and as soon as he gets in the holy place, and he tries to do it, God struck him with leprosy. And what did the Levites do? They backed away immediately with shock because they knew what just happened. They take him and they drag him out and they left him and took him completely out of the city and he would never return to Jerusalem ever again. His last few years of his life, he spent outside of the camp. This is really important. God raised him for a time to enlarge the southern kingdom to make him strong, but when he rebelled against God, he was brought under dominion. During that same period of time, something else was going on. An earthquake hit as a result of this. In the middle of this, there's another prophet named Jonah. Anybody ever heard of him? Okay. Jonah is being is sent to the king who just came to power in the northern kingdom named Jeroboam II. And he's told, the scripture tells us that he tells Jeroboam, the Lord has told me that you are to grow the kingdom to its largest borders it ever has. What's going on? Judah grows to its largest borders. Israel's going to grow to its largest borders and become strong. Right before both kingdoms crash and destroy. Sound familiar? Yes, it does. God will bring you up. He will bless you. He'll, he'll let you know everything that he's blessed you with. He'll give you everything to show you. When he takes it away, you'll never forget it's you that brought about your own demise. This is so important. So when we read what, what Isaiah is doing, we understand you've got two kingdoms who've been brought up in wealth and power and strength. And then Isaiah is brought into the middle of this. Now let's read this. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, okay, 
I saw that I was sitting on a throne. He's going to a council. Right? High and lifted up. And the trains of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim, this is, I, love, I love this because this gives you a picture that we don't have glimpse to. But Isaiah was given glimpse to one time. Seraphim were standing above him. Each had six wings. Two he covered his face. Two he covered his feet. And two that used, the seraphim was used to fly. Okay. And one called out to another. They began to speak to one another in prayer. Holy, holy, holy is Adonai Saul. This is our, the Yehovah, the King of hosts, Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And they began to sing this. Okay, so here you have, here in Isaiah, he's brought in the spirit just like Micaiah. Let me say it again. Micaiah was brought into a council, right, in the spirit. And here Isaiah has been brought in the same exact way in the spirit as being brought into the council. But notice what Isaiah does. Let's read this. Verse 4. Then the post of the door trembled at the voice of those who called in the house of Jerusalem. I believe as this trembling took place in the heavenly realm, the earthquake hit the earth on the, the earth realm. I think they were simultaneous. I think it happened. I believe Isaiah was going in his time of prayer. He got on his knees. He could have been in the third hour, the sixth hour. We don't know. He was going in at the time of prayer. And as he was taken in the spirit to this end, and the whole earth got hit with an earthquake. But I guarantee he was oblivious to it. He didn't know what was going on in the earth, but he knew what was going on in the heavenly realm. And this is what he witnessed, what he wrote. Then the post of the door trembled at the voice of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Oi to me, Isaiah says this. Now this is a humble man. Oi to me, for I am ruined. And he's fearful for his life, because he knows where he's at. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I am dwelling among people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king of the nice hour. He recognizes with his eyes the spirit where he's at. This is this is so sobering. I don't I don't think I think we would all if, you know Daniel said he got sick in the presence of the Lord. Isaiah's feeling the same thing. He's feeling overwhelmed by this thing. And he knows his he knows the things he's been saying with Shai Marah. He's probably he, he's saying, My lips are tainted. I got iniquity on my lips. And that's what happens. Verse 6 says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a glowing coal in his hands. Where did he get those coals from? All through the heavens. He took one of the coals, the eternal fire that's in the heavenly realm. He took one of those coals, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sins are torn. That was a big deal. What, what did that do for Isaiah? Confidence, strength. You feel he belonged there in the council. <coughs> that's that's key. He belongs in the council now. Because he now he now reached a level what his iniquity would take. Iniquity would been taken away. Behold, this has touched us your love, your iniquity has been taken away, and your sins atoned for. Now read what it says in verse 8. Then I heard the voice of all of I saying, Whom should I send? Who will go for us? There's a council. Who will go for us? Now he's been brought into the spirit, and notice what he says. He nanny. Here I am. Who else said that? Remember who else said that? Samuel. Samuel said that when he heard the voice of the Lord, he named me. Here I am. It's powerful words. I will go. Send me. And the council was made, and Isaiah responded. He spoke one time in that council. That's all he said. I'm going. Amen. Abraham spoke multiple times, right? There's been times when you speak multiple things, and sometimes when you only have one word. And sometimes you just listen and you walk and remember. Okay? These councils are important. What was the purpose of the council? Well, it tells us here. Isaiah 6, verse 9 says, Then he said, Go tell the people, this is, this is the message today. Hear without understanding, and see without perceiving. Make the heart of the people fat, their ears are heavy, their eyes are blind, else they would see with their own eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. In that generation, you have two kingdoms that have been given great things, and they're getting ready to collapse, and the word of the Lord that they're not here. Do you know what happened to Isaiah? They tell us it's not in scripture, but it's biblical material says that it was cut in half because they didn't want to hear this message. The horrible thing that happened to this man. A man who was brought into the council of the Lord, who had the humility to recognize that he wasn't he had no right to be there, that God atoned for his sins. This is awesome. But yet the people decided to take before we get done here, let's look at this. Isaiah 6 to 11 says, Then I said, He asked a question. 
not than I. How long? answers. <coughs> Until cities are laid waste and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. You know, I believe that we read the book of Revelations, right? And we invented a doctrine that says we're not going to be there to see all this stuff. But I read that book, and it says cities are being destroyed, nations are being brought down, things are being brought down in one day, it says, right? And I don't see anywhere it says, I'm going to take the people and I'm going to take them out of this. All I hear in the book of Revelation is you need to repent and turn to the Lord, because those seven churches were given warnings, were they not? So if those seven churches were given warnings, and only one says, I'm going to keep it for the final hour of trial, that means they're going to be there. That means they have the same problems in this generation as we have in our generation. We invent fables to get out of trouble. And that's what that is, a fable. Let's look at the final council. This one I like. Luke 9, verse, this is the final council. Luke 9, verse 28. Now it came to pass about eight days. Okay, so where is eight days important? And where, where is eight days important? What's that? Circumcision, what else? Where is an eight day celebration important? Yeah. The final day is to Very good. All right. So let's let's see if we can follow our train here. Okay. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, John, and James. Is that a council? That's a council. Okay. He took three of them. They went up to the mountain. Now some people say this is Mount Hermon on the north side of Israel. It, it could be any mountain. We don't know what it is. But let's say Mount Hermon. He went up to the mountain to pray, and he prayed, and the appearance of his face was altered. Whose appearance was altered? Yeshua. He completely transfigured. As he was altered, and his, and, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him for Moses and Elijah. Now let's stop right there. We have from the earthly realm two to three witnesses that are brought into a council. We have from the heavenly realm two witnesses that are brought into a council. We have we have we have a whole, we have five plus Yeshua in this council. Now in this council. He'll take the earth, the ones from the earth in the realm, and he'll put them to sleep while he's talking to the ones in heaven. Right? There's, there's things going on here. Now, follow this. As he prayed, the appearance of the face was altered. His robe became white and glistening. Behold, the two men, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to call his first. What's the purpose of this council? It's that last slide. About what's going to happen in Jerusalem. His death, his resurrection. I believe the things he also talked about was his return. I think there's something to talk about because this is outside of time now. He's talking about his his what's getting ready to happen in Jerusalem, but he's also going to convey the thought of what's going to happen on his return. Because I believe these two men, these two witnesses, are the two witnesses that are going to be in the Revelation. So we read here in verse 32. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. What happened? He put him to sleep while his counsel was going on because he gave him a little information, put him to sleep, and then he began to come. The counsel kept going on, right? At the end of the council with Elijah and uh, with Moses, he says, And when they were fully awake, they came back, they saw his glory, and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Yeshua, Master, remember he's still calling him Master, Master, is it good for us to be here? And let us make three tabernacles. Now, why did he do that? It's the final day of Sukkot. He's brought in a council. It's an appointed time. It's a Moedim. And we know now it's on Sukkot. So all important events, all time, every time we see a council, justice, judgment, these taking place, are going to take place during either one of them. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Shavuot, First Fruits, uh, you know, uh, Trumpets, Yom Kippur, or Sukkot. It's going to happen in those seven times. It's not going to be out of line. It will always be in those appointed times. That's why our daily appointed times are just as important. Remember that? Yeah. And two men stood with him. And when it happened, as they were parting from that, Peter said to Yeshua, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he's saying. Verse 34. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. They're taking up now, right? And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And the voice has ceased, Yeshua is not alone. But they kept quiet. And this is this is important. Because sometimes in the council, like Isaiah, you've got to go and tell the people what you said. Sometimes, like Micaiah, you've got to go tell just the king. And sometimes, like this, but they kept quiet and told no one of those days of the things they'd seen. Why were they told to be quiet? 
In these councils, you'll be given very specific instructions of what to do. And sometimes we'll be going, there are people, I, I've read a book by Reese, Reese Howell, it's, it's called Intercessory Prayer. And he was told he could go before, he's taking it in the prayer. It's an amazing book. If you've never read this, you want to understand the Intercessory Prayer, you read this book. It's written in the Bible the Bible. And in this book, he was told to go before the partners. And he was a coal miner. This guy didn't have a he didn't have a suit or a hat to wear into Parliament, and he was told this coal miner who worked in the mines and wells was told to go speak before Parliament, and he did. It's important. I'm telling you, it's not just the guy who's powerful and got money and a thing. It's the person who's humble. Okay. All right, let's finish up. I believe Yeshua wants his friends to know how to operate in these councils. I believe he wants to take us to. I believe that your prayer life needs to be better. I believe your faith has to become stronger. I believe that you need to believe that you belong here. I'll say it again. I believe you need to know that you belong here. That you're part of this kingdom, and regardless of your circumstances, you belong here. I believe there's a foundation being laid. Something's getting ready to happen on this earth. I think it's going to happen very soon. Some of you can give revelation. Some of you may not realize this. But something as big is about ready to happen. Okay? I believe it's time that we step up our prayers and we really focus on what God's will is in our personal lives and begin to really take off. Don't slow down. Don't, don't let anything distract you. Monday morning gets, it's work, you go to work in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom. You go and ask Him what your will is. Because something's getting ready to happen very soon, I believe. I don't know. I just know it's going to affect this entire country and the planet. Something's going to happen. We're seeing things happening in the spirit. We know, everybody, non-believers and believers know something's up. And we know that Israel's come back. It's, we're coming out of Jubilee from Jerusalem here in return. So we know we're there. So this is what I ask you to do today. Take these times as appointed hours in your prayers. Take the time and ask, Lord, what is my will? For you? What's your will for me? And don't let the sun set before you know what it is. And if you're in his will, Pray that he takes you to another level. Okay? Another level. Be bold. Don't shrink from it. 